having me, Kate, to have this chat with you. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Sidi Holloway. Uh, as lovely as that introduction was, I'm the presenter of a show called Secrets of the London Underground. Uh, but I also run a program for the London Transport Museum called Hidden London. And we take people on tours behind scenes of, of the London Transport Network. So we go into disused underground stations, secret bunkers, and things like that. So it was, uh, I believe, was it last year or was it earlier this no, year? No, it was earlier this year. God, this City year's flown by. <laughs> um, we got a lovely email from Kate uh, talking about the book and asking if, uh, well, asking if she could come on one of our tours uh, of one of the shelters that we have, which is called Clapham South Deep Level Shelter, actually built in response to that dreadful period of the Blitz. And so, of course, I went immediately, yes, and then immediately wanted to read her book so I could talk to her about it because I'm such a, a bibliophile. And we stayed down there. <laughs> For the best part of the day, I think. Because yeah. <laughs> I think it was my first time I've ever met an author of a novel that I really loved. So I was just asking her, well, what about Ruby? Who, who is she based on? And, and what about Clara? Is she somebody, you know, where's the voice coming from? So I guess the first question I want to ask, Kate, is... How did you, where did this story come from? Where did that, that wow. love um, begin? So firstly, I just want to say thank you for taking me underground oh. <laughs> and exploring that My labyrinth pleasure. of tunnels. Yeah. If you've never been down to Clapham South, to the underground under there, I highly recommend that you book onto one of their tours because it was incredible. Oh yeah. This, I don't think these microphones are working, are they? Can they? I think this one is, but are you speaking to yours? Yeah, can you hear me now? Oh, there you go. Oh, that's better. So, um, so yeah, Sidi and I spent an absolutely enthralling day underground just exploring this labyrinth of tunnels. And for me, it was really thrilling because I'd already written the book by then. Um, so I'd done my research and I'd interviewed people. But then, after I'd written it, I met Sidi and we went underground. And it's even deeper, Clapham South. I mean, how, how far below ground is it? So it's Clapham South is 40 metres below ground. Bethnal Green Station would be about 23 yeah. or so. But it was a very evocative experience because we sort of plunged right into the guts of London. And you can actually hear the tube trains running over your head. Mm -hmm. So you're so far down below ground. And then the biggest thrill, we went through this corridor and there were these triple bunks that lined the tunnels, just as it would have been at Bethnal Green. And when I wrote the novel, I had to use that from my imagination, from photographs. So to actually walk in tunnels was unbelievable to me. We, it was just mind-blowing. So we had such a great day. There's not many people you know that you can spend a whole day underground <laughs> with and both of us be such geeks that we enjoyed it so much. I think in the end, we, the people who were with us were sort of going like... Uh, we've been under here for... because we've been underground for three hours. But, um, but London's such a, a sort of teeming, kind of vibrant, mm. noisy city. And then to find yourself underground in perfect peace and quiet, just the occasional sort of zigzag mm. of a tube train above your head. I could have lived down there. It's, it's so immersive. Yeah. Um, so that was, so what, going back to your original so question. So the question is, uh, you know, what, what inspired the book? Uh, of course, your love of libraries, but was there a re particular reason? Because, of course, you wrote that book prior about yeah. the ladies. Of, yes. So the, the, biggest, the biggest inspiration for the book is sitting right here, the lovely Pat Spicer, who I met probably about five or six years ago, and Pat and I were talking, and I asked her, what was it like during the Blitz? Mm -hmm. How did you survive it? And I sort of had a slightly, uh, I, I subscribed to that slightly cliched, slightly stereotype, clumsy image of the Blitz that everybody yes. was sort of sleeping on a you know, dismal underground platform. But what, of course, I hadn't banked on was the resilience mm -hmm. and the subversiveness and the creativity of EastEnders, mm -hmm. who took that underground station and transformed it. You know, at the outset of the Blitz, Churchill said, oh, well, we can't let people shelter underground because they'll descend into troglodytes. Mm -hmm. You know, they won't know how to, what to do. They won't come back out. But, of course, that's to completely demean working people yes. who, of course, not only went underground, um, but transformed that whole underground community into this thriving subterranean community where, you know, I, I find it mind-blowing that this is, a, this is a place that had doctor's quarters, libraries, theatres, Sadler's Wells Ballet, um, Russian opera singers, you could get your hair done, you could leave your children in a creche, um, and you know, these newly enfranchised women could go to work. And all this before a welfare state is in place. Mm -hmm. It well, was incredibly it, really. Well, it was, this yeah. This is the thing that, that a lot of people, and I think uh, to David's point earlier, and to Clyde's, 
Um, it's really important to remember that after all that adversity, people really understood what community meant and really understood the importance of giving people free health care, taking care of other people's children, making sure that we're all spending a bit of time doing that. So, you know, these shelters were really the birthplace of yeah. the, the institutions that we hold so dear, such as the NHS and the public library. So it's, it really touches nicely on yeah, that in the book. Yeah, absolutely. And, and alongside that, you know, the, the library system coming up and that coming up in line with this sort of embryonic welfare state. Mm. So for me, it was just, it, it was absolutely contrary to every story that I'd ever heard about the Blitz. I love surprises in history. And so when you find something like that, just casually mentioned by this lovely lady mm. sitting on the front row here, who said, you know, it, it sparked a lifelong love of reading. And that one line alone, that just sort of got me right in the heart. And I thought, that's a novel. Yeah, that gives you know, me a little bit of chill. Because I love the sense that. of people becoming, you know, with, with so many schools closed down during the, bits, during the Blitz, the sense that people could be library educated really sparked something in me. The thought mm. that you go into a library as a child and you, it fosters this love of reading, but also that sense of escape, you know, can you imagine being 78 feet below ground, not knowing if your house will stand, mm. not knowing when you're going to see your loved ones next, you know, you're taking a shower in a, in a life boy shower outside Bethnal Green Town yes. Hall, you're living off powdered egg, yeah. to open a book and just disappear into its pages and the solace and the yeah. sanctuary, and that's what Pat really impressed upon me. So How thank wonderful. you, Pat. Oh, wonderful. I'm so glad you're here, Pat. Yeah, thank you so, much so much for inspiring this beautiful novel. But I think one of the I think one of the beautiful things that your no your novel does is um, it gives a real sense of the place and time. It gives a real sense of how these people are feeling. I mean, one of my favourite bits is that they're all trying to uh, to to read this one dirty novel, and they all want to go in that. And I so understand that because of course you'd want to you know do that with your girlfriends when that was pretty much all you had. There was no Netflix or anything like that. Um, but it's one of those things you, you just mentioned. You know the viscerality of it, which really comes across in the book, you know, because often people, like you say, they have kind of a, a vague idea of what the Blitz was and what the war was, which was this sort of keep calm and carry on and everything was sort of fine and we'll be all right and everyone's just walking over broken glass and it's just all right. Um, it wasn't quite like that. Of course, it was devastating and terrifying and people were hungry and tired and worried and dirty, probably smelt pretty bad. Um, like Ruby says, she's not washed her hair in many days, so that's why she's always got a scarf on and things like that. So you really, you really captured that sense. Yeah, I like, but when I'm writing, I like to write in terms of smells, how things mm. smell, how they, you know, all those senses are so important, I think. But it, for me, it's the only way I can write. And I love, so many people told me about the smells down there that, you know, the smell was so thick you could almost bump into it. <laughs> yeah. And I love that sense. And I think it was you, Ray, that said to me, um, it smelled absolutely evil down there. <laughs> what was the smell that you remember most? Yeah, yeah it did. Uh, well, did, I remember, uh, I remember my mother saying, you know, the carbolic smell, oh, what they yeah. used in them days. Mm -hmm. And that was full of it. As soon as you walked in there, you, you got boom, you, you was it with it. It hit you, yeah. yeah. But what was interesting about talking to you, Ray, was that for, for many people, like when I spoke to Pat and another lovely lady called Patsy, when they recalled their life and their childhoods unfolding underground, it was with great nostalgia and they enjoyed it. You know, they mm. felt that it was a home from home and they felt safe. But it wasn't like that for you. And no, this is, like you didn't feel that way at all. For you, it was, well, you explain in your words. Well, I suppose most of it after the uh, happened over there. When you think of what did happen, but the actual, you know, getting out of bed and actually having to go down in places. Let me just, uh, let me just pop that mic a little bit closer yeah. to your mouth. Yeah. We want to hear you. Wanna hear you it's got to be yeah. real close. It's <laughs> that weird thing. Okay. <laughs> there you go. They used to call me Big Nap, but it hurt me so much. <laughs> Yeah, yeah it, it's just a matter of the fact that you had to go into them places, you know, so with me I was at nine at a time and I was very small and you, know, you get a terrible frightening. Mm -hmm. It's. Uh, and were you scared? Do you remember feeling scared below ground? Uh, I think the most scary part was seeing the searchlights as you were walking down towards those places. Mm. It was like once you was down the underground, you was all right. Once you heard the, uh, 
he saw the searchlights and he, he knew what was happening up above. Mm -hmm. And uh, I suppose that's why all the rush started in the yeah. first place, wasn't it? But yeah. It's, uh, Actually being in a shelter, it's, uh, I think it was just a way of life, wasn't it, with people? Yeah. How old yeah. were you when you slept down there, Ray? Well, the war started when I was six. Uh, I suppose we, we, started, we did have a Henderson shelter in the garden, but mm -hmm. I think they were all frightened of using that. Uh, probably about seven years of age, I should imagine, start going down there when it first started. The, I think the main part of it was... Uh, all the bombing in what you see on, on the uh, round in the city with the incendiary bombs and all that. Mm. We was we used to stay in the railway arches, which is down the bottom area, and it was full of uh, <laughs> it was full of straw at the time. And when you <laughs> drop, drop the incendiary bombs, all that uh, it was like hot metal coming down there. Yeah. And oh gosh! If, if, you, if you wanted to get away from that, that's the only place you could go to, into the underground. Mm. It's, uh, little did we know at the time what was going to happen down there. Well, right. So maybe that's a good time to lead into that to that next question. I mean, so obviously I talk about the Bethnal Green tube disaster in the novel because it, it's impossible to set a book in Bethnal Green and not discuss that and talk about it because everybody in Bethnal Green knew somebody. Who had oh, yeah. who had died in that disaster? Yeah. Do you feel able, Ray, to tell us a bit about your experiences, your memories of that night, March 1943? Well, I can tell you from leaving home where we lived was uh, well, N6 Street was where the park is down the bottom. Yeah, and we would all left. Uh, we lived at number nine, and my grandparents lived at number three, so you had to pass their house. So. There was about five of us left our house, and then we've got the grandfather and grandmother. And being that uh, like myself and my sister and brothers would, would be in front walking, uh, walked along the Cambridge Heath Road towards, and you could see all these searchlights. And I think that was a really frightening part of the time. Mm -hmm. uh, I was getting towards, uh, I, I didn't really hear, hear any. Uh, the guns, what they was talking about, until actually you got right near the station. But, uh, I don't know. I, 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 actually, my, my father stopped to pick, to, stop at, uh, his, to pick his father up at number three. But normally, they never went down there. And it was just that one night they went down there, they didn't survive. But, uh, Why did they not usually go down there, eh? Uh, <laughs> Well, I suppose I was 66 and it was too much down the stairs and that. <laughs> <laughs> Creaky knees. Yeah. We had a, there was a, afterwards they built a big old brick shelter in the, in the street. So you could either use that, which mm. it wouldn't have been very safe. If you no. Would, you know, nothing from bombs or anything like that. But the, uh, uh, people talk about it, about uh, we bombed Berlin. And they was all expecting then that we was going to get really hit bad. Well, I think that was the main reason for going down there. Right. But, uh, I can remember getting to the end of the stairs and well, going into the stairs and then everything seemed to happen. Everything was screaming. Uh, I, don't know. I don't even remember going down the stairs. I was carried in between people. Right. And uh, I don't think my feet touched the ground in any case. <laughs> we ended up at the bottom where the square is. Uh, I mean, people were out there, they were falling over and being picked up. And somehow or the other, I was with my, my sister, was uh, nearest to me. My two brothers disappeared, I don't know where they went to, but I was there somewhere. But so uh, we got pulled out of that part. And uh, I remember the, where they built the second entrance, there used to be a room there. Uh, I, I thought that was the not a first aid room, but now it's the part that goes up to the street, which is an entrance. Okay. It was just a big room. And that's where they sent us over to there. Mm -hmm. uh, we were sitting in there. And you could see them pulling the people out, coming out of here. And after a while, when we found out we was all right, I was go down to the bottom. I was down to the main, uh, the main escalators right to the bottom. I mean, once we got down there, we stayed down there, I don't know, probably two or three hours for the rest of the night. Uh, but you see, 
people coming down in dribs and drabs. I, I suppose as they've been pulled out and I've made sure that was all right, I came, to, I came down on stairs. But there was only the one stair working, as I remember at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we stayed down the bottom waiting, to myself, my sister, at 17, and two brothers. And I remember one other brother kept going up to find out if we could go home. And you know, they were still pulling people out by that time. Uh, uh, so when we did get out in the morning, it was my thing. Uh, I remember coming out, well, my sister was the main one in charge, you know, she was a big sister, take you home, you go out there. We, normally we'd come out of the station, turn left, walk along Cambridge Heath Road. But as we went to turn left, there were some people quickly stood across the pavement, sent us across the road. And there was vehicles all over the road at the time. I suppose that's what they were using to take the people away. Uh, and I could see the, well, basically you could just see the feet of people that were sticking out. There was people was laying on the floor. That's, uh, those are the ones that didn't survive. Uh, I I went, the, the next part when we got home, we were just sit, sitting indoors waiting for the rest of the night for the parents to come home, which obviously I didn't do. So I think that's where the main my life started after yeah. that. My next weeks and days, you know. It's, uh, How did you even become, I mean, cause <coughs> at the age that you are at, such a tender age, to lose, you know, half your family like that? How did you even become, begin to come to terms with that? How did you as a child deal with that? Well, I don't think I did come to terms with it for a long time. Uh, I think I, I've told you before, I was at school and the teacher was a brute of a man. <laughs> uh, it, that's it. The, the, it was all quiet in the classroom. I remember it. It was very quiet. They was doing their work, wherever it was. And I must have started shaking. Uh, he picked up his keys, a big bunch of keys, and threw them at me. Uh, what was, a bully. I was throwing a bucket, oh. you know. <laughs> He just shouted out, what's the matter with you, let me, do you want to go to the toilet? I said, no, sir, no, sir, I'm still shaking. Uh, I, th I had no idea what it was, what it was at the time. Oh, gosh. That was I mean, a dramatic I, shock. Yeah. Yeah. I found out I mean, when I was doing my national service, I'd seen some of the people that come back suffering from shock, so I knew what it was at the time I mm. went through. But, yeah, you know, it's... it's and was it, was it discussed much? Because obviously everybody was told, you know, you mustn't speak about this, you know, don't breathe a word of it, because if it gets into the enemy's hands, it's bad for that all-important word, morale. But how did, were you as a child aware of that, of this sense of being silenced? Yeah, it was something, I, 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 at the time, I, I thought just pe people didn't want to talk about it. No. I, I asked my mother once or twice you know, where she was on the stairs and she wouldn't say anything. But there was only... We got, I must have been near the bottom of the part, and they were still at the top, or near the top part somewhere, which they didn't survive. So if I'd have stayed with them, because normally I would have stayed with my father. It was only that I was running in front with my sister and brothers that sort of escaped out of it. Mm -hmm. uh, but so, I mean, it was a time so after that it went on. Yeah. I remember somebody coming round the house talking to my mother. They wanted to take me and my brother into uh, Dr. Bernardo's. Why? <laughs> well, it's just somewhere, yeah, I suppose, yeah. Take, take, take the kids away from you. Because she couldn't cope. She'd oh, been in right. hospital. Uh, she was, she, she'd been hurt while she'd be on the stairs, and that was lucky she did survive. Yeah. So, uh, we were lucky we didn't end up in the uh, Bernardo's. Because mm. you know what happens to a lot of them yeah. kids. Yeah. So the whole course of your life was changed that night, wasn't it? Definitely, yeah, yeah. yeah. How do you feel about it, looking back, reflecting back now? Do, is well, there anger still there towards authorities, or do you feel it, some acceptance of what happened? Everybody, everybody was in the same boat, I think. You, did, you didn't just didn't think about it. Each day was another day to live for that day and get through to tomorrow. Right. I mean, my life changed when I got sort of national service. You, your life changed, yeah. and you, it was better off altogether. I think the, the years after that, uh, well, the weeks and months and years after it happened, was very bad because it, you know, 
you, do you remember, they had to fight to get uh, yeah. some sort of money. I mean, I always remember my mother saying there was a, well, there was a young friend of mine I used to go with. I don't know if there's anybody here. Uh, I, I was friend with Leslie, Leslie Baker, his name. Uh, I don't know, we'll ask. Yeah. We'll find out. <laughs> yeah. oh, his, his sister and his father died there. Uh, That's very fascinating. Incredible to hear your memories. Thank you for sharing yeah, that with you us. Just, you just didn't talk about it. You was all in the same yeah. same position. Now. I think it's so shocking for us, Ray, to, to hear you talking about it and know that you lost a father and grandparents that night. And the kind of reaction from your teacher when you were suffering clearly oh, yeah. from what was post-traumatic yeah. shock was to have a bunch of keys thrown at you. Yeah. It seems shocking to us, but that it's an insight, isn't it, into how people were supposed to just, yeah, just get on with it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Do you feel proud of I could tell you something else about the teacher. But oh, I yeah. I <laughs> I've heard, on my travels I have, yeah. uh, and my interviews, I've heard a lot of stories about teachers and uh, cruelty and, and the way that children were treated well, that I leaves me... I think they only took people in the school teaching that didn't go in the army. They couldn't <laughs> go in the army. Oh. <laughs> Full of bitterness. Yeah. But, um, but I'm so grateful to you, Ray, because mm. for talking to me about what you experienced, that trauma but also to you and to people like Pat, because I couldn't write novels set around this historical time frame without mm. speaking to you and you conveying a lot of that anger and the bitterness and the fear and the trauma and the pain, because that cuts over this narrative of the myth of the Blitz. Well, I did have a lot of anger. Everybody, I think in those days, hated the Germans. The hatred for the Germans was terrible. But when I did my national service, I was in Germany for almost two years. Mm. And you see what they went through. And right. Everything changed for me then. Did it? Um, I had friends friends over there. Yeah, they, they suffered as bad oh, as yeah. us. Yeah, 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 yeah. Without doubt. I mean, yeah. Sidi, I'm sure you know some of the statistics on the, the Blitz, and, you know, the bombing of Dresden and, oh, yeah. and German cities. It's, it's, you know, absolutely. And, and, and just how the population was being starved, yeah. pretty much. You know, the, the austerity was rife here, but, you know, in, the, in Germany it was even worse in many ways. Um, very, very beautiful to hear your memories. And, and I've got to say, it is really invaluable to hear these stories and hear these memories and it's a part, been a big part of my um, job as, as a historian is to, to conduct these interviews like you do Kate because once you you really viscerally hear them and, and you hear just things like how it smelt and how you felt and you know when you were running around and that sort of thing it's so important so I'd like to ask you Ray you of course stayed in Bethnal Green as well as you know um, in, in the shelter. What did you think of the shelter? Did you enjoy it? Did you have <laughs> light? Oh, you, you know, fun down there at different times. As, yeah. as, a, as a kid, you, could, you didn't realise what was going on in yeah. the war. But uh, it must have been terrible for our parents. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they were the ones that suffered, not us. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, you, you, you would play with the other kids and enjoy it. I remember Christmas down there, a Christmas tree. Mm. It's, uh, yep. yeah, it, it, it was just part of life. Do you remember, it went on. Do you remember any of the food eating down there at all? No, not really. <laughs> I don't think if you, I don't know, you took it down there with you, if you had any yeah. more food. Either. They would have flasks uh, or something. In some of the shelters, they would have tube refreshments or they would have, because in shelters, as a part of morale, they, they, they would be off rations. So you could buy as much as you wanted of oh. those refreshments, but they were quite dear. I don't, I don't remember yeah. any of that. Oh. Yeah. But oh. I'm guessing it mainly was spam sandwiches. And oh, it yes. Wasn't anything of it great. doesn't look appetizing at all, but um, <laughs> we've spoken to, I've spoken to a lady who stayed in one of our shelters in Clapham, and she particularly remembered the jam tarts because she hadn't, <laughs> been, you know, hadn't had jam for such a long time. <laughs> and then in 1944, they were given jam tarts and even some tiny bot morsels of sausage rolls. And she still remembered that 80 years later, so I think that was wonderful. <laughs> These are the I'm sure Pat also remembers as well, just that, that joy of, of, um, of eating, <laughs> which I'm sure we all share. <laughs> when we start uh, today, yeah. I've got to ask, obviously, you, you wanted to write this story, and I've got to say that the characters are very clear. And I asked you this when we did the 
uh, talk for Barnet Libraries, they're all sort of based on people you've spoken with, right? Yeah, very much. When you when you start researching and you're looking around, then you see that the likes of Mrs. Chumley mm. and Dr. Joan Martin, this book came with a ready-made cast of characters. You know, the, the only real characters, I suppose, that I've completely drawn from my imagination, I suppose, is Clara and Ruby. Mm. But even Ruby is very much based on a wonderful lady I know called Minxie, whose daughters are here today, who was just such a force of nature, wasn't she? Blonde, you know, laughed like a drain. She'd light up a room. And she was so charismatic and such a typical, quick-witted, funny East Ender. So Ruby is very much minxy. Mm. Clara is kind of drawn from all the librarians that I've interviewed yeah. um, over the years. But, but all these people that come into the book, you know, right down to a boy that sells, you know, jacket potatoes, dragging them along the, you know, the, yes. the floor of the tunnel. He was a real person. <laughs> why, would you, why would you not put those Absolutely. characters in the book? It's just... Right I mean, I could have written this book as non-fiction, I guess, in a way I could, but, but I think in order for people to get up close to the past and to feel emotionally connected to it, we need to be told a story. And I think that's how I've reconciled it in myself, as opposed to writing non-fiction. I think do fiction because it's a way of people connecting emotionally to a story. So that's why I, I carry on with it. Oh, and your books are just wonderful. I mean, I think personally, as a historian that writes <laughs> non-fiction books, um, they, <laughs> no, I mean, you know what, it was something that Kate did say to me, she was like, you should write about this, and I was like, I have no idea where to start, so that was my, going to be my last question, how, do you, how did you start, which, which part did you start, up, start with? God, that's a really good you, question. You know, people got to go to court, if I started talking about Mrs Baker, they had to go, go to court to get a claim, to, to get... Uh, Compensation. Oh, yes. pensions. I was, yeah. I was going to get nothing. Yeah. No, that's, that's and that's not talked about either, is it? The compensation yeah. and, and the sense of justice for all that those people lost. You mm. have to fight for it even then. I didn't want to give them anything. Yeah. I mean, money well, was very short for everybody, so... Yeah. yeah. But, but, but people did get compensation in the end, did they? Eventually. Yeah, they did, after, after, after a fight. After gone, the, the main, uh, they used that Mrs Baker to go to court to use ah. it as a... She was the main one. And can I ask, did your, mother, did your mum get compensation then? Yeah, yeah. They, uh, well, not comp actually compensation. They got, they got a war widow's pension. A war widow's pension for the uh, loss of a husband. That, you wouldn't get anything mm. if they didn't go to court. Yeah. But, yeah, in those days, if, if, you didn't, if you didn't go to work, so what would you do? Well, right, exactly. There was no, <laughs> yeah, there was no welfare state at that stage, no, was there? No benefits. You no. had to go to work. Yeah. What did your mum do? She was a machinist. Ah, hmm. There was a, a factory just on along the fact over here. London oh, Brothers, I bet there's a lot of people who remember that. <laughs> Big machinist. Yeah. She worked there with my sister. But, uh, you'd go there early in the morning till late at night. And then they'd bring big bundles of work home with them and start machining oh, all God. night. Wow. <laughs> what tales your mum could tell? I wish I'd met her. Sorry? I wish I'd met your mum. <laughs> what tales she could tell. Yeah, I wish I would have asked her a lot more questions. I remember well, I did ask her about where she was at the time, at, uh, on the stairs. And she wouldn't talk about it. Would she not? No. And why was that, do you think? Do you think because it was so ingrained that you're not allowed to speak? Or do you think she just buried it down no, deep? No, just buried in you. You wouldn't talk about it. Yeah. You didn't want to. It hurt you so much, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I, when people say they were told not to talk about it, I think it hurt you so much to talk about it. Mm. Which just is speaking the unspeakable. Yeah. yeah. Because I think in many ways talking about yeah. it with people in yeah. the community might have helped. Yeah. Oh. The but time. it's but it's interesting because I heard this phrase the other day and it really struck me. It was that the need to share is overcoming the desire to forget. And I really feel that that now we're sort of almost eighty years on. I mean, next March will be the eightieth anniversary of the tube disaster and it will be the last ever uh, memorial that's gonna take place at St John's. So do all come if you're free. But I feel like we are reaching that, that dam of memories is almost bursting now, and yeah. it's time to share those stories while we still can. Do you feel that way, Ray, yourself, or is it not a conscious thing like that for you? Not for myself, but I do, you know, conscious that everybody else wants to learn about it, and that's, that's quite reasonable. You know, yeah. Obviously, otherwise you're going to lose it as part of history. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, uh, well, we're really grateful to you oh, for yeah. discussing it because, oh, yeah. you know, we're asking you to dig up a traumatic event from 80 years ago. Um, so I'm very, very grateful. Yeah. <laughs> thank yeah. you. Ray. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Give a hand to Ray.
Um. Right. Well, um, to think, so are we going to get a few questions from? Well, it might be a good opportunity for, for me to introduce John Drury, yeah. who is here who has spent the last, well, he can tell you exactly how many years, but some considerable time researching the tube disaster yeah. and looking at it again afresh. So it'd be really lovely to hear John's research into that That's and what you found. Hello. Oh, there you go. Thanks. Hi, yeah. John. Hello. Don't, yeah, thanks very much, Kate, for having me in this, in this lovely about place. Over at, uh, Clapham. Clapham. Oh, sorry, yeah. You said people could have lived down there. They did mm -hmm. live down there. Yeah. I, I, on recently, there was a program on TV. I think that was City's program. Which was it? Windrush, wasn't it? They yeah. all went down there. <laughs> they, they lived down there. Yes. Um. Well, they, there was a curfew. They always had a curfew. So um, <laughs> people were, were, were booted out of those shelters at 7 a.m. in the morning, and they were only let back in at 7 p.m., and that was to fumigate and clean. Um, one of the big fears that people had after the First World War, which a lot of people don't know, is that um, a lot of people sheltered in the underground during the First World War. Uh, a lot of people sort of forget that London was bombed then. Uh, and then at the end of the First World War was the outbreak of what we call the Spanish influenza. And so a lot of people made the correlations that all those people stacked in the underground together, particularly during 1917 and 18, was potentially a cause for the outbreak of the virus. Okay. And so there was also a fear of people actually staying in the underground, per both because they didn't want them to mm. be become troglodytes, they didn't want that shelter mentality, they had a, a railway to run which had to disperse the population from the centre of town, uh, but also they were fearful of, 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 the, of, of disease, so they had to mm. be cleaned every night. And interestingly you saying that, when I went down to Bethnal Green, midway through writing the book, it was a sort of um, that lapse between lockdowns. Yes. And I went down to the tunnels and there was not a soul about, everybody had their masks on and there was a big sign on the wall saying, we fumigate these tunnels regularly. Yeah. And I thought, how ironic, yes. you know, because I knew that during the Blitz they did daily fumigations. Yes. I thought, well, here we go, 80 years on, nothing's changed. Which probably was... We're just fighting a new yeah. pandemic. <laughs> probably terribly carcinogenic, <laughs> yeah. I, I would imagine, but there we go. So, yeah. John, sorry to, to, to yeah. cut you off. Thank you so much for joining us. So... Would you tell us, so why did you want to look at the disaster again? What was the cause of that? Yeah, yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, I should say a little bit about my, my background. I'm a social psychologist, and I study behaviour in emergencies and disasters. Oh. And I've been doing that for 20 or 30 years, and I've looked at uh, the London bombings and Hillsborough. I'm not the first to say this, but actually the, the idea that people panic in emergencies and disasters is regarded in the scholarly literature as a myth, because mm. typically people cooperate with each other and their fears are often reasonable. But panic is a way of blaming victims and it persists again and again. You keep finding it even though the scholarly literature contradicts it. But Bethnal Green is sometimes regarded as the exception. So even people that reject the myth of panic say, well, actually Bethnal Green was different. So there was a reason to look at it again and what we did was we went back to the, um, the witness statements back in the, in the Dunn uh, inquiry and looked at um, how people described what they did, what they saw. And in particular, looking at two things, um, were their um, concerns reasonable? Because the idea was, as you know, that the sound of the guns prompted a surge that led to the, uh, led to the crush. Mm. Uh, but few people were actually responding, were, were overreacting to those, uh, to those guns because most people's uh, anxieties was completely uh, proportionate to the, to the threat around, uh, surrounding them. Uh, and if you look at the way people behaved too, it tended to be normative, by which I mean people were not overreacting, people were not uh, behaving selfishly, people were behaving in routine ways that you would expect them to behave when they were threatened with, uh, threatened with, with bombing. And, and as um, Kate's already said, I mean, the, the proximal cause of the disaster was not people running into the, into the shelter, it was someone tripping up. It was actually a safety issue that led to that, led mm. to that disaster. Yeah. Uh, so my, my aim is, in the scholarly aim, the scientific aim, but also to kind of, uh, to recast mm. this event and try to create a, you know, a proper, a uh, more true account of what actually happened that avoids blaming the victims. It's very interesting. Yeah. 
fascinating and so relevant and so overdue as yeah. well. And that's, is there anywhere? John, is there anywhere where people can uh, access your work or, or uh, learn more about what you do? Yeah, we only just finished writing it up, and uh, it was actually published as a preprint about a week ago. Okay. So it has to go through peer review, um, uh, but it is available as a preprint. Um, so uh, that's uh, available online at the moment. It will be published in the journal in a few months. Very interesting work, really and, is. Yeah, fascinating. And do you think that we can learn anything from the way that Bethnal Green community, that, that sort of tight-knit community, do you see any parallels today in the way that communities have reacted since the pandemic, or are we looking at a completely different society? Is there anything that you can draw from the past that has some relevance today? Yeah, because um, you know, the idea of the blitz spirit, that's not really new, because the original sociologists that looked at cooperative behaviour in emergencies and disasters were inspired by what actually happened um, during, during the blitz. And we know that in the first two months of the pandemic, solidarity was really a thing. Mm -hmm. uh, you had mutual aid groups. I know it kind of didn't yeah. last, but you, you had that two months of really strong solidarity, a, a massive spike in the number of people um, uh, joining mutual aid groups, showing neighbourliness and, and so on. And that is common in emergencies and disasters. Um, and, and solidarity and, and neighbourliness was also um, evident in some of the behaviour in the, in, the, in, the, in the disaster, whereby people trying to get into the tunnel were trying to be with their loved ones. They weren't behaving in selfish ways, they were trying to be with the people they cared about. Yeah. Thank Very you, interesting. John. Well, thank you so much for, jo for talk telling us about that, John. And, and we now have uh, our next one, which is Robert Jones, if you'd like to come up uh, and grab yeah. that. that. Like grab you as a <laughs> <laughs> I described you earlier, Robert, as a history professor. I gave you a promotion. Yes. <laughs> you know what? This, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I like it. I think just take it. Yeah. I think you should. Why not? No, I think um, it's interesting. So, Robert, could you tell us a little bit about the, the reading for victory? Because this is something that um, Kate features in her book. They get a beautiful shipment of books from overseas and it just brightens the whole library up. And it, it's a really wonderful moment in the, in, in the book. But I, I do wonder, you know, if you could tell us a little bit more about the, the context of that. Yeah, it's a, it's a campaign that started before the war started itself, because yeah, they, they thought war was inevitable. Yeah. And uh, it was a campaign started by you know, librarians, really, to champion the library service, yeah. So, so they said things like, yeah, we've heard for dig for victory, so why not read for victory? So they realised that you could use a library service for that. So, mm. yeah, the library service has always been about sort of education and often, you know, that was promoted just as an educational institution. So they thought at the start of the war, why not use the library service to educate people about things that they could expect during the war. So if they've been signed up for war service or if they have you know, factory work, go to the library, read mm. the technical books, learn mm -hmm. about it. Yeah, they, they, they promoted books, like don't sound very interesting, but you know, how to mend war wounds and fractures. And I think you <laughs> mentioned that in your book. And, I then, did, you know, yes. and it's that sort of thing that they, they try to encourage people to read. Yeah. Those sorts of technical books to learn about how to behave and how to, how to work, get through the, the war period. Really. Mm. And I mean, of yeah. course, where else would you have had access to books like that mm. if you hadn't gone to school, you know, say medical school or whatnot? Yeah. Uh, it's very interesting. Do you, w wait, Kate, didn't you tell me once what was the most popular book during the wartime? It wasn't War Wounds. <laughs> it definitely war wasn't Practice of War Wounds. No, I believe it was Gone with the Wind. Yeah. yeah. 1942, that was huge, that book. But what you explained to me, Robin, really fascinated me and actually became a bit of the backbone of the book was this real war of words that erupted yeah. in, the, in the library and publishing industry, particularly in the interwar years, yeah. that basically said, that, and I find this shocking today, that women, particularly working class women, shouldn't be able to read what they really want to read. They needed to be pointed in the direction of edifying fair. They didn't, you know, women could get emotional. Don't give them anything that's going to get the blood racing. Yeah. You know, oh, give them the classics. Sort and, of and Mayfair that. lady type thing, yeah. I would say. Oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But there were some staggering quotes that I think you pointed me in the direction of these, um, Rob, but there was one librarian who said, and I quote, if women have not enough energy left to read anything but trash, we should be doing them a real service if we prevent them from reading at all. Yeah. And that's a librarian. Yeah, that's and a I librarian. Find that's, yeah. In one Oof. of the publishing trade papers, they, they, they had, as you said, in the interwar period, real significant debates about the purpose of reading and, and re reading fiction. So libraries, the, the highest books 
borrowed from libraries are always fiction books. Uh, but there was real debates within the publishing trade about whether libraries should lend fiction books, whether it should just be people going to use libraries to, to learn and educate themselves. So they said if you read fiction, it should be good fiction, so things like Austin or Dickens, and, <laughs> and they, they criticised what they termed as light fiction. There was one Peterborough librarian who called them sort of the to be a butterflies of fiction, they just float away. So the, the most, actually one of the most popular authors at that time was uh, someone who, I don't know whether, whether anyone would have ever heard of, is Ethel M. Dahl, but she oh, was yeah, huge she at was that massive. time. Yeah, she was massive at that time. And people like she was Ruby a bit like Barbara Cartland, wasn't she? Yeah, she was yeah, a kind really of romantic popular, novelist. But they hated particularly women reading those books. Why? They, they, um, because they thought they would lead them astray. They did. They, <laughs> they gave well, them too much auto yeah. autonomy. Yeah. <laughs> women's reading really started. <laughs> women's reading really started sort of growing after the end of the, the First World War, and I think it's sort of the emancipation of the oh, war. Oh yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, made women to think, well, we've done this journal, and we can carry on doing things that we've done during the war, post war. Mm. And so, it's the publisher, publishers started to publish books aimed at women who were busy, who could pick up the book and put it down in the middle of a yeah. working day and, 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 uh, yeah, and, and, and just be able to keep the reading habit going. But the, the, yeah, so some of the leading lights in the publishing world really didn't like yeah. it, as you say. They wanted them to read more edifying fare. Well, exactly. But if you think about it, if I, and, and I was reflecting on this, if I'm sheltering 78 feet below ground, I don't know when I'm going to see my husband next. My children might be evacuated. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know if my home's going to be standing. Do I want to be reading classics or do I want a really good piece of escapist fiction? Mm. That's what you want, you know, something to whisk you away from the crash and, and the horror and the yeah. bang of war, to press yeah. pause on your thoughts. They, they did realise that. I mean, they said the, the campaign at the start of the war was, you know, read for victory, and the whole point of it was to, you know, to prepare yourself for war and read these technical books and that sort of thing. But they also realised that people wanted to escape. And, uh, and to keep, keep morale high and production yeah. levels high and that sort of thing, you've got to give the people what they want. Yeah. So, so across you know, different um, things like cinema as well, yeah, they, they would promote, uh, they, they would allow people to read uh, and yeah. watch those sorts of things. So, yeah, yeah. But, that but that's another fiction. one of those interesting... Um, effects that came about because of the war, mm. isn't it, is the fact that we as modern, you know, women, writers, readers, bloggers, whatever, we're all benefiting from that change, that softening of attitudes that came about because of the Blitz. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So it's another one of those surprising things that comes about through the Blitz that we talked about earlier that mm. you wouldn't expect to come from that sort of quite dark crucible. No, that, that's the thing. I think, it's, again, it's because women were, were, were doing roles that had traditionally been done by men and, you know, particularly as, as the w looking towards the end of the war, they realised they didn't want to... What happened at the end of the First World War was, mm -hmm. I suppose, retrenchment and go back into the roles that you had before. And, yes. you know, um, yeah, and women that didn't want to do that, understandably that, so. Yeah, yeah and, and they said that after this war, things are going to change. And, that, yeah, that was yeah. a recognition yeah. of that, yes. So it was, it was, I'm really grateful to you as well, because I couldn't... You know, when I began researching it, and obviously we went into lockdown, there was this fantastic study by the Mass Observation um, Survey that had been published talking, and they surveyed 10,000 people talking about what they read. And I couldn't access that, and you, man you managed to get that to me, so I'm very grateful oh, to very you nice. for that. I had a PDF copy left. Yeah. <laughs> on my computer, so I yeah. have the email that too. But I just got to say, one of the, the, my most favourite books, and I did read the books that I just had my readers reading within the wartime library, and one of them was a, a book called Forever Amber. And I don't know how many people here might remember that, but oh, Doreen's I nodding like her head. I like the giggles. I like the giggles that are coming through. This That's was, nice. I think it was probably the world's first sort of bonk buster. Can I call it that? Bit I don't know. Raunchy. Bit, Bit raunchy. raunchy. It's very tame, actually, by today's standards. It's no... You know, it was it's that, no 50 that shades time, of grey. 50 Shades of Grey, wasn't it? Yeah. But it was. <laughs> it was pretty explosive when it came out midway through the war. And it was banned, I think, in 15 states of America. Yeah. And apparently they counted, somebody, why you would count this, I don't know, somebody counted 70 references to sexual intercourse, 39 illegitimate pregnancies, 7 abortions, 10 descriptions of women undressing in front of men as a reason for banning the novel, and it sold 100,000 copies in its first week. Sounds so there like you a go. good read to me, Clearly to I'm be right. honest. <laughs> I'm writing the wrong genre. I'll have to borrow that one from you, So of course, when I found that out, I thought, that's got to go in. Who wouldn't? I mean, she was an incredible character Amber Sinclair she literally sort of romped her way through the rubble of Restoration London I loved it that's the thing about her is it is because <laughs> <laughs> you'll have to go back and reread it Doreen <laughs> I think, uh, those sort of pieces of fiction 
women, they, they may not want to do what those characters did, but they can imagine yeah. that sort of thing. So, so that you can get into it a book you a and license, you can read it and it? think, this is so exciting, and read that. And you may not do that in your real yeah. life, but it actually gives you that, that sense. And I think that's what's interesting about sort of when, when these sort of critics said about you should read more edifying fare. It's like Pinkerton Smythe. Yeah, they're, 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 they're his character. There <laughs> yes. were publishing trade characters who were writing into these publishing trade papers saying you know, women shouldn't be reading that sort of stuff and you know any, any of this light fiction shouldn't be be borrowed from libraries at all and it shouldn't exist mm. and yeah yeah the, the words that they use about about reading habits is always very critical because they think that libraries should be just about lending good fiction or technical books yeah but it was so fascinating to me to uncover that and it became such a central thread of the book and I hadn't meant it to be at all, but I must just read one other comment that I found in the Library Association record. It wasn't just men, actually. Women could be equal critics. Mm. So writing in the Library Association record in 1942, Hilda McGill from Manchester Public Library wrote of the surge of housewives who find themselves with more time on their hands as their husbands are away serving and end up in the public library. And she said, at 18, she probably read the light novels of the day. As literacy has increased, so has the standard of light reading depressed itself to something approaching imbecility. But she conceded, it's better to read a light novel than skim the pages of an illustrated paper on the basis that even the most foolish book is a kind of leaky boat on a sea of wisdom. Some of the wisdom will get in anyway. I thought, I wonder what she'd make of my book. <laughs> I suppose that's less than the one you said about earlier when he said yes. that they better not read anything at all. Yeah, yeah. You know, I suppose that is if slightly given If it's not cookbooks, you shouldn't be reading well, quite, reading yeah. 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 Yeah, I mean, I guess people didn't like, you know, women reading about lady, women like Amber Sinclair, who was ruthlessly scheming and saw every man as an opportunity to kind of get one over on them or to increase her position in life. You know, who, why would you want women reading something like that? It's, it's the same. I mean, there's a film, huge film. I don't know if anyone remembers it, The Wicked Lady. Yeah, where you've got a character, Margaret Lockwood, who schemes and murders and, and has yeah, extramarital affairs. It's that sort of thing that people. It was a top-grossing film in 1945. People wanted to see yeah, that sort yeah. of thing. And yeah, just said they might not want to get up to what they're getting up to, but they can imagine themselves that freedom, yeah. as you say, dive into a book. Yeah. Because it's escapers, it. escapers. Yes. That's yeah. why we read, isn't it? from the bombs and the barrels that's and, going around you. And yeah. there really is nothing like losing yourself in a great book, no. is there? Yeah. There's just nothing quite like it. And then when you finish, you feel that sense of both accomplishment and sadness that it's over. That's I how agree. I, felt I agree. I don't always want to finish book. reading, do you? You're no, always like... It's just like I'll put the last <sighs> chapter, no. No, I, I don't want it to end. I know. Yeah. And we all have such individual ways of reading, don't we? Some people like to read on Kindle. For me, I like a paperback book in my hand. It feels more intimate. Yeah. And I love that sense of just pressing pause on mm. life. And one of the things that I really enjoyed most when researching this is this sense that so much has changed in 80 years. You know, technology, every, life has changed beyond imagining. Mm -hmm. But the way that we digest books and what we get out of reading has not changed. Yeah. I think it's really wonderful. I mean, I actually uh, simply re no, said read uh, half of your book by Audible. So I oh, listened to it because um, I do that with a lot of books because I'm a runner and so I'm always out on long runs constantly. And it's a really nice way of digesting books. Plus, there are so many brilliant performers and the lady who, who read your book, just phenomenal. It did you enjoy it? I haven't actually listened to it on audio. Oh, it's, it's very good. <laughs> I word recommend for it. it. Yeah, I recommend it. But um, like you said, people are digesting it in different ways. Yeah. You know, I can, I can switch from a Kindle to a book to an Audible. Um, my partner does not like reading on Kindle like you. So it's just interesting how it changes, isn't it? How people have preferences. Uh, have you got anything to share with us finally, Kate? Um, the only thing I actually did want to read out was a little bit of my author's note that just for me, this book is my love letter to libraries and to librarians. So I'll just read it out, if I may. And I forgot my glasses, so hopefully I can read it. Libraries have changed from quiet, hushed repositories of books to vibrant cultural community hubs. And I can confidently say that the people who work in libraries are amongst the nicest and most hardworking on earth. I have a hunch they do a lot of unpaid work. Before Corona, I did a lot of library talks and experienced the behind the scenes planning that goes into these events the homemade cakes, the posters, the social media, and the setting up and clearing away of these evening and weekends events, I'm fairly certain isn't reflected in their pay. They are frontline workers, used to dealing with the mentally ill, the disenfranchised, the homeless, the lonely and vulnerable, whilst navigating the complexities of whatever is thrown their way. 
One librarian I interviewed told me she never knows what, day, what each day might bring and that only the previous week she dealt with an overdose in the foyer. A librarian is often the only person that someone might talk to all day. What's more, they have the emotional intelligence to deal with whoever walks in through the door, which to my mind makes them more than someone that just loans out books. They're part counsellor, social worker, listening ear, facilitator and friend. When I started my interviews, the COVID-19 pandemic began and I saw firsthand how many libraries changed roles almost overnight to helping out with supporting the elderly and those in need by dropping off food parcels, delivering books on bikes, collecting medication, and checking that those people who could so easily slip between the cracks in society did not go ignored. During the Second World War, at the time this book is set, libraries were in peril from bombs, rockets, and paper rationing. Today, our much loved but beleaguered public libraries are under threat once more from something more stealthy, cuts and closures. After years of austerity and now COVID, they're under strain to deliver more services than ever before, while council leaders, under pressure to make cuts, sharpen their knives. They are, as Chief Librarian John Pateman told me, easy targets. There is hardly any money saved by closing libraries, but when you close a library, bad things start to happen in the neighbourhood where the library used to be. It's difficult to prove the positive monetary value of a library, but it is easy to prove once it's been taken away. The library is the glue that holds a community together. Another librarian told me that after the closure of her of local children's centre, babies are now weighed in her library. Don't hard-working communities deserve more? The importance of libraries was recognised by the Public Libraries Act 1850. Since a further act in 1964, there has been a statutory requirement for the provision of a free local library service. The surge in reading throughout the pandemic and the flexibility and skill of library staff in dealing with the outbreak proves how relevant and important libraries are within our community. They are our birthright and our inheritance. A library is the only place that you can go from cradle to grave that is free, safe, democratic, and no one will try to flog you anything. You don't have to part with a penny to travel the world. It's the heartbeat of a community offering precious resources to people in need. It's a place to be, to dream, and to escape with books. And what's more precious than that? So here's to all library workers. We need you. Um, and I think, actually, before we go into the Q&A, this might be a nice opportunity to raise our glasses in a toast to Bethnal Green Library and wish this grand old lady of literature a very happy 100th birthday. Here's to 100 more years. And cheers. cheers to you. Cheers. Happy, happy birthday. birthday. <laughs> and now, I think, if anyone's got any questions to anyone on the panel, mm. we'd love to hear them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I knew someone had asked so, that. <laughs> I mean, Ray, do you, do you remember you, you, you remember the toilets? I mean, I know from a non-experiential, but historic way, but do you remember the toilets? Yeah. Were they grim? <laughs> yeah, who didn't? Wow. Yeah, what's, your, what's the memory? The smell? Mm. Oh. Buckets, basically. But actually... Sid, yeah. that's a good opportunity for you to explain the toilet situation at, at Clapham. Yeah, in many it's places. Story. It's actually very interesting. So, yeah, you do have to wonder about it because one of the difficulties that you have with thousands of people sheltering in the underground is where do they go for life's necessities, i.e., you know, the bathroom. And um, it's a tricky one because all underground stations are below sewer levels, or at least deep tube bonds that would pr protect you from bombs. So they came up with this solution of bringing LSAN toilets into the, into the underground, which is, for those who are unaware, basically a bucket with a seat and some blue disinfectant in the bottom. But then what do you do when that fills up and how quickly does that fill up? Well, you have, have to have a way of getting rid of the waste, but you're below sewer level. So what are you going to do? Get it on the escalator and bring it up in, a, in, in an open... <laughs> in an open um, bucket. So uh, they came up with this very ingenious system that they used in many shelters, which is uh, they have a big tank, normally in a lift shaft or a shaft that is connected to, um, to the surface. It has a big funnel on it, and uh, you pour the contents into the funnel, and then once the, 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 
the tank is full, you close the valve very, very, very tightly. And then with a switch, you turn on the compressed air and it shoots it up to um, sewer levels. So it's like a reverse. Hmm? Normally, they would have, it, in different places, they're different. So in Bethnal Green, I believe they had cubicles or at least with some bit of, um, but some bit of, well, it was basically like a cloth, but pretty much uh, covering that. And you would have sort of little cubicles with a little cloth thing. Um, in the deep shelters, like the one we have, they had slightly better facilities because it was purpose built, you know, so they had actually designed it as a proper toilet. Um, but in the underground, it was wherever there was space and whatever was, you'd have to make do. And most of the people I've spoken to just remember one thing, you avoided it so much because the smell was awful. <laughs> yeah. I think most of the people from Buffalo Green used the toilet. So it was in the middle of the road in, what well, is some of them ball there? Right oh, was in the there middle of the road. Public toilets there. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. yeah. I think in, in the early days, before they transformed the station, it was, in, it was a bucket, <laughs> wasn't it? People used to come out of the station and go down there. <laughs> in Buffalo Green, they had buckets. Yep. Ah, there we go, Pat. Thank you, Pat. That's wonderful. Very basic. Did you yes. have to use those, Pat? Did yes. you? Use? <laughs> Do you remember how bad was the smell, Pat? Yeah, <laughs> it confirms my suspicions. <laughs> I also always feel when I when I first heard of this is how awful would it be for those who have to empty? So they oh had God. station staff that had to lift them up and empty them. We have a photograph of a man doing this at one of the tube oh. shelters, and I was like, he's person, not getting paid enough. Well, from. it must have done. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good question, though. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Uh, was there any babies born? And oh. if so, did their birth certificates have the name of the station when they were born? <laughs> the central line. Yeah. <laughs> Somewhere oh, in Bethlehem. That's a good question. It's a good question. There must have been. Yeah, I mean, well, I know of one famous, m famous person who was born in Highgate Tube Station, which was similar to Bethnal Green in that Highgate had not been opened at the time. So it was... Um, that you had to catch the train to get there because they hadn't even connected it to the ground. Um, weirdly enough, Jerry Springer, the American television host, was born on the platforms of Highgate Station in Stop 1942. It. Really? No, I don't. I'm not telling a lie. There you go, then. Yeah. So there That's you are. That's amazing. <laughs> and you think there was seven thousand? Just made him so angry. He had to go <laughs> fight people for the rest of his career. <laughs> Um, but yeah, that's so people would, would yeah. have but babies, guess, they unfortunately would have miscarriages, they would have all sorts of things, yeah. of course, because of the stress of getting in. They also had a lot of other things, didn't they? There was a phrase I heard, somebody called it double bunking, <laughs> and there was no double bunking allowed below ground. Yes, people have couldn't... asked me about that, and I say, I normally say, well, the thing is, people we speak to were children at the time, so we don't really know much about that sort of thing. <laughs> Maybe we should ask you, Ray. <laughs> Staying silent. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, do we have any more questions? Oh, we have one at the back. Um, I'd like to ask about the campaign by the survivors for, to get redress after and get compensation. Mm. Um, my granddad was Harry Beacon, who was the caretaker for the library from <gasps> 1922 to 1946, so right through the war. I know very little about him except the newspaper cutting which said, a meeting of the survivors was addressed by the local active trade union, Harry Beacon, to get compensation. But I've no idea what happened about the campaign for compensation. I imagine it was very difficult mm. because everybody was told not to speak about it. Yeah. But I mean, it's, it's just like Hillsborough, and like all green. Yeah. People I think... want to get compensation, they want recognition, don't they? they yeah. But do you know anything about what happened? Myself personally, no, but um, Stairway to Heaven Memorial, the secretary there, Sandra Scotting, she will know a lot more about that than, than myself, about who got compensation, how, what amounts. Um, but I can ask her, I can ask that question for you. I would imagine it would have been, I mean, particularly this was a, it would have been a tricky one because the, the disaster was very buried. It wasn't. It wasn't publicised very, um, very widely, um, as you said about this whole thing of kind of keeping calm and carrying on, not talking about it. They really tried to hide the fact that this happened. It was the worst kind of 
you know, fatality. Well, yeah, and and they really didn't, you know, and so I would imagine it would have, I don't personally know much about that campaign, but I do know, you know, even people who'd been bombed out of their house um, wouldn't get compensation or anything until 1946. So it took a whole year of just, all right, we now have to deal with the post-war world. What does that look like? So it'd be it's, interesting to know. It's so interesting. And I think that's, I might be wrong here, but I think that's why the Citizens Advice Bureau was formed mm -hmm. to centralise all those agencies because somebody worked out that if your house was bombed, you had to walk an average of 11 miles to go to all the different bureaucratic departments to get this form and that form. And, and so that's why I think the CAB was formed. My dad, who's sitting over here, works for the Citizens Advice Bureau. He can tell you. <laughs> Oh, thanks, Dad. <laughs> Let's say you're right. I think you are. Yeah, absolutely. Um, do you have any more questions, ladies and gents? Oh, got one over there. Great questions, by the way. It's always such a nice way to sort of dialogue with the audience like this. Yeah, very much enjoyed this evening. Um, just briefly on John Drury's comment, um, Professor Simon Wesley from the Institute of Psychology, Neuroscience and psychiatry at King's College was on Desert Island Discs a little while ago and he said something very similar from his research that in those kind of events people don't tend to panic uh, and they you know actually tend to actually run towards the disaster rather than away from them and he mm -hmm. rather wryly observed that where you see film of people running away from something often it's because there are people in authority telling them to run away rather than them actually doing it themselves which is interesting. Yeah. Um, but he's, yeah, he's studied a lot of those kind of disasters as well. Um, I was interested, we had someone speak whose father was a caretaker at the library in the mid-century. I, I wondered how much we know about the ways that the library changed in its use from the, the 1922 picture, which was recreated earlier, to, uh, to the post-war period. I mean, how did it relate to local schools? You know, how did kids use it? How did adults use it? You know, did the stock change? Obviously, it's changed a lot today from what it was, yeah. you know, yeah. apart from having rather rusty computers in their side rooms and so on. <laughs> God, that's a good question. That might be the follow-up <laughs> to do I the post-war years. I, yeah, maybe do one f that is set in 1922. Yeah. And then maybe one in sort of 1956 mileage, or something, you know, maybe <laughs> something like that. I don't, I don't know is the yeah. honest answer. I guess it came up about with the, with the founding of the welfare state. Mm. I guess that became the sort of model upon which everything else was based. So I don't know how much autonomy libraries lost when they were merged within the welfare state. Um, mm. But that's a very good question. And I shall endeavour to find out. <laughs> it's a nice way of saying I don't know. <laughs> yep. Oh, I think we've got one at the back there. Um, could we borrow the library, a fair enough history, please put in paperback. Oh. oh, there you go. Perfect. Why library workers are angels. There you go. Ask a librarian. That's the. That's absolutely right. Right. If we don't have any more questions, I think it's uh, time to say thank well, you so much. It is. I just want to say a few thank yous, and then we've got a very special treat because we have Lottie and Stan who are going to come up and do a little. Um, one of the biggest things, actually, that I was it was impressed upon me about life underground in Bethnal Graham is entertainment. You know, the, the vibrancy of life down there. We had lovely Minxy singing down there with her sisters. You know, Bethel Green's answer to the Andrews sisters. We did you, have lovely entertainment. Lovely yeah. entertainment, yeah. And, and, and Fienza concerts every night. Yeah. Awful. <laughs> <laughs> Once a fortnight. Once a fortnight. Because you, you did tap dancing down there, didn't you, Pat? Uh, yeah. yeah. I was a tap dancer. Oh, <laughs> fantastic. Not of sorts. <laughs> But I remember somebody saying, you know, this lovely lady, Kathy, who sadly passed away, and she said, we didn't wait for people to entertain us, we entertained them. And so I thought it'd be really nice to finish off with a bit of original East End entertainment. Um, but before I do, I just want to say thank you so much to everybody for coming, all the librarians that I've interviewed who have filled my head with stories and my heart with admiration, to all my lovely friends and my mum and dad for putting up with me all the time. Thank you, I love you. <laughs> And to all the wonderful librarians here at Bethnal Green and to this fantastic panel, I'm so pleased to have sat alongside Siddy and, and dear Ray and Pat and everybody else that I've interviewed. Um, it's been such a privilege and a pleasure, this book. Um, I don't think I've... Oh, and my friend Donna, who's here somewhere, who made all the bread pudding for today. And lovely Liz, who's sitting over here, who I've never met before. I met her on Twitter and has flown all the way from Dublin. 
<laughs> and another lovely librarian who told me she's come all the way from Scotland as well. So <laughs> proof of it, everyone needed that librarians are wonderful. Good to people. you guys. Thank, Thank you so much for coming.